So uh, welcome everybody to Delaware. Um, and thanks to John and Agilent for um, allowing me to be up here and talk to you today um, about um, another project that came out of uh, Sean's lab, actually, um, the ice worm. But uh, at first, I'm going to just give you a little introduction uh, to the femtopulse. You guys should have all gotten um, one of these notes when you came in today. Um, and it just explains to you generally what the instrument does. But, but really, um, for us, uh, the biggest thing, and we use this guy all the time uh, in the lab, is it's, uh, it's really quick, um, it's very accurate, and it's super, super sensitive. So that's my um, sort of easy taking points from that. Um, you can read more if you want. So uh, when we first started doing PacBio, um, we had a fragment analyzer in the lab. And of course, as PacBio aged, uh, the size requirements sort of went up, and, and it became a, a little bit difficult for us to, to really accurately figure out what we had. So what you see here um, is a fragment analyzer traces of a, of a bunch of different um, DNA samples. And you see they all start to pile up at the end, right? Everybody that does this is sort of familiar with this. Um, and so Agilent came out with the Femto instrument, uh, which is a pulse field instrument. And we all know that we, when we learned straight up molecular biology, that pulse field is a way to pull apart really large pieces of DNA. Um, and, and this instrument, of course, doesn't look particularly different than your fragment analyzer, but the guts of it um, are, are different. And so what you get off of these same DNA samples when you put it on the femto is you start to see they're not all identical, right? They start to pull apart and you see um, a little bit more of their character. Uh, this purple line um, is just a genome quality number, which is a metric that comes off the instrument. You can set it to whatever size um, you wish it to be, and then it'll give you back um, an indication of the percentage of your sample that is larger than that number, okay? So it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a nice way to know what you've got, um, and, and you can tell customers back what their DNA really looks like. Um, so we eliminate this compression and we get a, a, a really a better idea of what's going on in the sample, which is also helpful for us um, with library construction and, and, and other things. Um, so what can you do on the instrument? Uh, basically everything that you need to do, um, and you can do it, um, it's not just for PacBio, we, can, we certainly use it um, for our other NGS um, applications as well. You can look at DNA, you can look at RNA, it's ultra sensitive. Um, it's probably 100 times more sensitive than anything else um, on the market. You get back nice quality numbers that you can pass along to people or that people might be looking for that they're used to seeing in, in other places. So uh, with that, who am I going to talk to you about today? Um, this little guy in the middle, uh, which is a glacial ice worm. Uh, it is the second strangest thing I've ever received uh, in the mail. I'll let you use your imagination as to what the most strange thing was, but uh, when we uh, had our um, smart grant competition, um, this one finished second, and, and so we were really interested in it and wanted to take a look at it and thought it was a pretty challenging project. Um, so Scott went out and collected some ice worms. They come um, from his or from the Pacific Northwest, but they, you can find them all the way into Alaska. Um, they're not particularly hard to find. Um, he sent them to us in a tube full of ice. Uh, and the weird thing is, they're not just in the ice, or on, they're not just on the ice, they're actually in the ice. So A, they were a lot smaller than I was led to believe they were. Uh, <laughs> and B, they were encased in ice cubes. So it made it for challenging to, to, uh, to isolate the DNA. And so as you saw in that video, um, I can maybe play it for you again, maybe not. Um, they will wiggle themselves out of ice if given new ice to see. And if you tap on the ice cube a little bit, they, they worm their way out. So once we got them out of the ice, um, we could get them in a tube. Um, and then I, I'll talk to you ab about that method in, in general, but we really were going to go with the low input protocol, right? We, he wanted to use one individual to do this. There's not a lot of worm there. We weren't, had no idea what we were going to get back DNA-wise. So we really wanted to use low input um, protocol that was sort of being beta tested, um, and we're going to we're going to of course use the femto to to quality assure. Um, oops, wrong button. Really, the wrong button. Try to do it like this way. To quality assure along the way. So we're going to preliminary look at our our um, gDNA. There was in this case no shearing, but we use it all the time post shear. 
Um, we're going to take a look at what our smart bell looks like, and if we do any kind of size selection, we're going to check it again. And because the input levels are so low on this, that's not a problem for this protocol. So how do we go about getting the DNA out once we convince them to get out of their ice cubes um, and into a tube? It was actually relatively easy from there. We used Kyogen's Magatrack kit. This is not the only kit we use in the lab, but this one was like, it's super easy to change volumes of elution and stuff like that. So not knowing what we were going to get, we ended up using this one. So we just got them into a tube. We used this uh, polypropylene pestle to squish them up. They're very, very fragile. Um, you, it's almost very, very hard to pick them up without breaking them. You have to be super gentle. So squishing them apart was not a problem. Um, we changed the uh, protocol a little bit. We carry out the lysis at a lower temperature for a really short amount of time. Um, you don't need much more than this. Like I said, they, they broke apart pretty easily. Um, we used, uh, they recommend using a thermomixer in the protocol. We ended up using a rotator. We see better recovery of longer DNA that way. Um, and so we did two elutions. Uh, some of the longer stuff stays on their beads for quite a while. So if you just kind of do one quick elution and throw the beads away, you're actually throwing some of your best stuff away in our uh, experience. So um, for right now, we're going to go with two worms. So it's a tale of two worms here for a bit. Uh, we did more. These were just the ones that we went forward with. Uh, and from now on, they'll be called worm one and worm three. Um, and these are the traces. And you can see the um, genomic DNA actually looks pretty good. And more um, encouragingly, well, the yield was not bad. So these suckers have quite a bit of DNA in them. Uh, they do vary in size, so I think there's not the variability here is I think just this one will happen to be a bit bigger of a worm, okay? But as far as they look, they look pretty good. And with this particular size pro profile, um, we didn't need to shear or, or anything. We just moved straight forward with the um, genomic DNA that we had. Um, one mentioned, too, in, in another use of the femto, um, you can use qubit dilution. So if you're really, really limited on the amount of DNA that you have and you still want to look at it, um, if you're going to make a qubit dilution, which you have to do moving forward, um, you can put that on the femto and still get size information out of it um, straight out of the qubit dilution tube. Uh, so what do we do moving forward with these two different isolations? Uh, with worm one, because we had so much DNA, um, we decided actually to, to cut it on the blue pippin. We did a 10 kb cut, um, one, just to size select it, and two, these worms, as you saw, are quite pigmented. And some of that pigment carried over into the, in the DNA prep, and we were concerned that that might affect sequencing downstream. Uh, and sometimes when we blue pip and cut things, it actually tends to clean the DNA by dragging it you know, through the, the um, matrix. So um, we figured we would give it a shot. Uh, as with all things blue pippin, um, sometimes you get back lots, and sometimes you get back not much. We didn't get back much. So we got about 100 nanograms. But with the low input protocol, you can go ahead and make a library from that that isn't a problem. We got a, a serviceable amount of library uh, at an accurate size. Uh, with worm three, we had less DNA to start, so we took a different approach. We just went straight with the gDNA um, into the protocol. We didn't do any size selection before, um, but we did clean the final smart bell library with a modified Ampere protocol. I know Paul talked about it this morning. Um, that you can clean fragments that are less than 3, bit, 3 kb. So we did that. We, of course, got um, much more library um, right around the same size. And so what do these two libraries look like? Oh, this is the um, bead cleanup. So in short, you just use a 1 to 2 and a half dilution of the stock Ampere beads, and then you clean the library with 2.2x beads. Simple. Um, if you make libraries all the time, you're used to doing it. It's nothing, nothing too um, crazy. So this is what the final smart bells look like. Um, they're pretty similar. Um, you can see one, one started out longer, so it's, of course, going to end up being longer. Um, we, we have less of this one than we do of, of that one. Um, in order to be able to see sort of, you can see our size selection worked. We got rid of some of our smaller stuff. This is what it looks like when you overlay them, one on top of, of each other. And you can see the genomic DNA is in black, the smart bell is in blue. And you can see that our, our smaller fragments, we've, we've done significant amounts to get rid of those. Right? So what do they look like when you put them on the instrument? So our initial approach, uh, worm three, the library was done before worm one. So that's why it's on top here. We took a, a standard 1M smart cell. We did a 10-hour movie with a two-hour pre-extension. Um, you always have to just sort of guess at loading concentration. Typically, we're somewhere between three and six picomolar. 
for libraries of this size. We chose four um, and kind of nailed it on the first uh, go around. We ended up with 14 gigabases of um, data, 22 KB um, average read length and an insert and 50 of 10.5. Um, we weren't super, like we didn't super love that. So we changed our approach and um, used an LR smart cell, upped our movie time to uh, 15 hours and took away the pre-extension. And you can see you get very similar loading um, but you do get uh, uh, an extension, uh, you know, an additional almost 4 KB in read length, and our insert and 50 um, went up. So this is moving forward what we would do. And then going back to that size selected, the Blue Pippin size selected library, what does that look like? So we used, again, those same, same parameters. Um, and as far as sequencing, it looks great. Uh, the pigment is not a problem. We, we don't, we don't, we're not seeing any additional cleaning here. The, the read lengths look ba basically the same between the two. Um, you do, of course, see a, a bump in your insert N50 because we did get rid of a lot of smaller, more smaller things. Um, but really, the loading is the story. Um, and we're not exactly sure what happened here. This could be kind of calculator related. We were using a beta calculator at the time. Improvements have been made. Um, but really what the moral of the story is for this particular project, um, it's not going to be enough. We're, we're not going to be able to sequence the amount of um, coverage that we need to do. So worm one will disappear from now on and we'll talk only about worm three. Um, so with the group, we decided to run a total of um, 10 smart cells out of the library. These were, uh, again, um, LR smart cells. So one worm, one library, 10 smart cells. Um, you can see our read lengths rain, remaining right around the same. Our insert N50 is hovering right around the same. We got um, 159 gigabases of data um, with almost 60 gigabases unique molecular year. It's almost 60 gigabases are over 10 KB in length as well. Um, so we thought that looked great. And um, as far as I was concerned, I sent it off. Um, so I'm going to speak now on behalf of Scott Hodling, who these are his worms and, and his project. And he ran um, sort of with the assembly. But you can see uh, here that he's, he's comparing it to um, related species. So there's not a lot out there that these things are perfectly related to. But they are segmented worms. And so he can compare them to a couple of things that are, that are similar to it. Uh, there's not, as far as uh, genome length, there's not much that competes. The earthworm is probably about the closest. Um, and so when you take a look at our assembly, we're getting appropriate lengths. He wasn't exactly quite sure. We're so, um, we, he had estimated around one and a half. We're right about 1.25 with the, the assembly that we have. Um, Contig N50 for the earthworm is atrocious. Um, and you can see we've um, knocked out of the water everything else that is sort of related. Most of these are um, short read assemblies, so that's not particularly surprising. Uh, and when you look at percent completeness, um, we're doing pretty good. There's, there's probably more work uh, uh, to be done here. And we had more library that we could have run. But with the 10 smart cells that we got, um, he feels pretty confident. Um, so it's contiguous. Does that actually matter for what he wants to move forward and do? Uh, and, and it does. You, you can pull some things out that are of interest to them. Um, a gene called AMP deaminase, um, which is a key regulator of energy metabolism. And these guys are, are weird, OK? So they live, this is a worm that lives in contact with ice at all times. Uh, they know that they have a, a very narrow range of where they're, they're, they can live, maybe five to six degrees, where they're comfortable and functioning. Um, so genes like this are going to probably be pretty important. Um, and they had had previously only a partial sequence for ice worms. Uh, so can we find it in his assembly? And yeah, he can. Uh, uh, I mean, it's nice and complete. Um, and then I can just show you this in general. This is his slide also. You can see that the missing information um, is no longer um, necessarily missing. Okay. So what's my conclusion from this? Um, the low input protocol works great. Um, you, you can make a library from as little as 100 nanograms, and probably there's PacBio folks that are going to tell you you can do even lower than that, and, and I'm sure that you can. Um, and depending on the size of your genome and your desired coverage, what you want to do with it, maybe that's going to be plenty for, for, for what you need to do. In this case, um, that, what, that particular library wasn't for us. Um, we sequenced uh, 10 cells, like I just told you, but we didn't sequence the entire library prep. Um, we had, you know, budget constraints and other things. We probably could have done 16 or 17 cells out of that library. That's a lot out of one 
tiny worm um, um, to be able to do. So that was really pleasant to see. Um, and obtaining long reads from one individual obviously can lead to an improved assembly, right? You're not looking at the heterogeneity that if you combine a whole bunch of worms together. Um, there's certainly more work to be done. And one caveat is that contamination is an issue, right? This is not an if, this is not in general. I took this ice worm out of a tube that had been living in ice and I threw it in a tube and I sequenced it. I sequenced everything that was on it I sequenced everything that was in its gut, right? So this is gonna be an issue. So, um, you know, in the future, when we talk about these low input products, that, that, is gonna be, that is gonna be a problem, right? We're gonna have to have tools to pull that out. And he's in the process of taking a look at the, of the data and seeing what else he can pull out. That may be great, that may be interesting. You might be interested in what's living inside your very small thing, right, or on it. Um, and so we'll have to see what, what falls out of that in the future. Um, if you don't have a femto and would like one, John and his group are here, talk to them. Um, and there are some deals out there for you. If you already have a femto or, uh, or in our CSP, there's some deals for you because um, you know you guys use these kits all the time and, and get a little bit of a deal there. So I thank them. And then I have to thank everybody else. So thanks to Agilent and John for, for allowing me to stand up here and talk to you. Um, thanks to um, Scott and Joanna for sending these guys in the mail. This was a lot of fun to do and, and we don't get to do a lot of fun things all the time. So this was, was a challenge and it was fun and I hope it helped them out. Uh, thanks to the po folks at PacBio to help me out. Nick, Heather, Michelle, and Sarah helped Scott with the assembly. So you guys are great to work with and, and I appreciate it. Uh, thanks to my group here. Um, I think somebody said it this morning, we are small but mighty. Um, so thanks to Bruce um, and to Mark and uh, I cannot stand up here and take credit for everything. Half of it belongs to Olga. Uh, she is my partner in crime. Uh, we, I think we share a brain most days. Um, and so we, 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 we don't do anything with bouncing it off each other for sure. Uh, you can find us at our, our website um, if you wish. And we are, so, uh, we are also a CSP as well. So you can find us on PacBio's CSP site, which is now newly filterable by location. And uh, platform as well. So, uh, yeah, um, I'll have to take any questions. <laughs>